Hello, YouTubers. This is another session in the podcast where we get to talk to uh, software engineers, amazing engineers from all over the world, working in some of the biggest tech companies around the world to talk about issues, to learn a little bit about themselves, you know, talk about topics, you know, that sometimes engineers, you know, kind of bring up in their, you know, discussions to kind of understand, you know, a direction to go forward about building a project or coming up with a prototype and everything else in between. I am joined today by two really near and dear people that I chat with online all the time. Uh, Mr. Michael Tonchev, he's a senior software engineering lead at Meta, also known as Facebook, so that's Zuckerberg team. And then we have, <laughs> we have, <laughs> We have Annie Bala Supramaniam. She is a, a a a principal research engineer at Microsoft, working on AI and great stuff, you know. So that's Microsoft team. And I'm gonna be just sitting here getting things a little bit more hyped up and be like, "Can you believe he said that? Can you believe she said that?" That's how we're gonna do this moving onwards. Um, uh, for for the two of you, Michael, do you want to go ahead and kind of introduce yourself and experience and tell us a little bit about yourself, sir? Sure. Yeah. So even though I'm team Meta right now, I've been here almost two years. I used to be team Microsoft. Uh, before that, I worked in um, Office, then in Education, and then on Bing. Currently, I Snakes work. were on, made. Yeah. <laughs> good, good, good. Currently, I work on uh, shops at Meta, and then before that, I worked for a uh, company in England for just uh, just about a year. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, Annie, do you want to tell us a little bit about you? Absolutely. Um, so first, I'd like to start by saying that programming is a hobby for me. So I get paid to go to work and, and just have fun. You know, so, so the pay is just kind of part of it, but I have fun. I've been programming since I was in fourth grade. And uh, I worked at a ton of companies, uh, mostly small. So I started back in India. And I started out as a graphics programmer. And then I slowly moved into HPC, GPGPU, medical imaging, that sort of thing, because Games wasn't really a big thing in India, and I did a lot of medical imaging. I've also done um, compute at scale, stream processing for video, which I think I'll bring up a lot of those examples today. And I worked uh, finally at Amazon as well recently, just before joining Microsoft, uh -huh. where I worked with Amazon Game Studios on some cloud rendering stuff. I worked on uh, real-time video streaming, some Twitch stuff as well as some uh, top secret research stuff that I can't talk about. Um, and here at Microsoft, I'm working on AI, ML, and robots. Nice. So, you know, all the all the stuff that you see behind me and everything. So so are we talking to real you or you you? <laughs> you know, is this, I'm is not this an sure AI? This, is, th this could be. Okay. Does not compute. <laughs> I'm, I'm <sorry. laughs> <laughs> That's okay. No, but I, I wouldn't do that. But I would know. All right. I'm 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 very honored and pleased to have both of you. You know, I really appreciate your opinions. So let me tell people watching us, you know, how did this happen? You know, as a lot of you may know, you know, I like to, you know, talk to engineers from everywhere. And sometimes, you know, some just, some topics come up, you know, and people kind of get really have, have a strong conviction from experiences they had, you know, uh, in one way or another. And I try to use this podcast to kind of bring these experiences to the mass majorities, you know, of engineers out there who don't get to be in the right place or the right time to hear these kind of experiences and learn from them. Uh, one of the biggest topics that, you know, we kind of summarized, you know, kind of five big points that we wanted to talk about. And, and one of these points was around automation. The question is here, you know, what does automating a system possibly at higher cost give us, right? Why should we automate at all? The question here in its core really, should you automate if the manual effort is cheaper? Or, you know, should you automate anyway you know, for long-term gains and potential, you know, uh, 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 consideration for uh, people's time, the people that will be working on that system manually when it can be easily, easily automated. Let's go with Michael first and see what's his, you know, kind of uh, ideas about this topic. Go ahead, Michael. Sure, thanks. Uh, first off, I just briefly, I forgot to say it earlier, but I wanted to thank you for having me on the podcast. Usually when I argue with people on Facebook, they block me. They don't invite me in a podcast <laughs> with uh, several thousand viewers or more. I don't, I don't know how many it is. So uh, unusual treatment. I agree. I gotta get used to it. <laughs> I agree. I agree with that too. Seven, seven, eight thousand, almost eight thousand. We'll be watching you. This is gonna be great. You know, yeah. I'm 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 really, I'm really, really 
Uh, I've been looking forward for this after the hackathon week because I know both of you have a lot of experience and I could learn something for myself. Too. So, so I thought to myself, you know what, you know, let's learn together. Let's see what, let's see what everyone has to say. You know I mean? It's a, it's a nice sunny day and let's sit down and just out nerd each other. So go ahead, Michael. <laughs> sunny with a little bit of uh, that Seattle haze in uh, early, early autumn. Right. Yeah. Right. So about the question, uh, I see it kind of as a question of what are the costs and benefits of automating systems? And I think we can probably both agree on the laundry list for benefits. And I'm just reading off my notes here. <laughs> uh, one of the main ones that I see is it's a forcing function to iron out issues that otherwise we might postpone in resolving. For example, uh, I think the easiest case here is continuous deployment. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have to do everything manually, then you always allow for little things to come up that are one-offs that might not even be that useful, but that are customarily Part yep. of the deployment process you have whereas if you say it has to deploy with one click then it forces you to iron out all those issues that you might not otherwise that's true, um, that's true. <clears throat> of course you have lower manual intervention cost when you automate things yep. kind of by by definition yep. people aren't involved in every decision or in every corner case uh, it's easier to monitor and to audit Mm -hmm. um, so harder to know exactly why someone made a decision manually, mm -hmm. um, and to follow the tr uh, the trace of that person as they made the decision. Whereas for an automated system, it can write exactly why it made that decision, unless yep. you flip a coin before making a decision. Uh, <laughs> right. A little bit of bogus sort for you right there. Exactly. You know? <laughs> yeah. uh, and then of course it's also not sub subjective, which is mm -hmm. a benefit oftentimes. On the other side, you have some costs as well. So for example, you have higher upfront costs for a system that might not even be used or useful in the long term. And mm -hmm. I want to zoom in on this a little bit because I think it goes a little deeper than it seems initially. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, upfront cost of engineering is visible, but I want to talk about a little bit about um, feature lifecycle. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a lot of reasons why features fail, in my opinion. First off, they get created and they don't move experiment metrics. Uh -huh. uh, from my time at Bing, uh, I kind of came to the opinion that most features are probably like this. A lot of smart people have a bunch of good ideas in a meeting. They implement them and like 10% of them actually move the metrics they thought they were going to move. Uh -huh. Then you also have features that you ship because you think it's a good feature. It has no regressions. It's kind of like a side thing that people can choose to go to. It's not. It's outside the critical path but very few people use it. So for example, uh, not to throw one of my own features under the bus, but we have the My Updates page on Bing. Uh -huh. And it's a cool little thing. You have news topics that you've signed up for, and so it shows you the specific relevant news you like. There's a nice little picture. You can see your saved images or whatever. So it's it's a fine feature, but it, I'm not going to I'm not going to say and stand here and say like it's a mega useful feature. No one really uses it. There's like a few thousand users a day, sure, but no one really uses it. Uh, okay. Another reason why features fail, in quotes, is that um, they get replaced by other features or other systems. So yeah. for my time at Bing, again, we had a personal data platform that stored uh, user interests for like uh -huh. finance uh, stocks or news items or sports teams. And then while I was there, I worked to replace it with a system called U3. Uh -huh unified user. I don't know what it means. <laughs> yep. They don't pay me anymore to remember what it means. Uh, <laughs> and, then, and then as I was leaving Microsoft, we started discussing replacing that one with one service, which was an oh. MSN based system for doing pretty much the same thing. Uh, and U3 hadn't even like, I, I would say that there was still some technical debt for fully transitioning PDP to U3. And before that was even done, we switched to one service and now one service. I occasionally oh. chat with some people there and uh, not to name names because, you know, insider information. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, right. Even one service isn't fully implemented yet. And I'm sure that some other system will come by and replace it. So there's a pattern that I've noticed of you work on a thing that gets replaced three years down the line. And it's not everything. There's got to be something that sticks around, but mm -hmm. it's often like that. And then oh. lastly, the uh, feature ahead, fails because it works well, but org priorities changed and the KPIs shifted and you lost your funding and now it's a maintenance cost. So this engineering cost that we 
pay upfront for building these features in a scalable or automated or like proper way that we like as engineers mm -hmm. come at the expense of like you're building a feature that you have no idea whether it will actually be successful in the long run or not. Okay. And so my, my main uh, stance is kind of a lot of features fail. You don't know which ones will fail ahead of time. And mm -hmm. so automation should be used in the right amount and at the right time. Uh, proofs okay. of concept might need less automation. Systems that are actively scaling in usage can benefit from more automation. So with every feature, as with every feature, you got to use a two by two matrix of cost to implement times impact of feature, right? Uh, okay. If you're like a small team or like a small company or a small product or an out of the way product, you can get away with less automation to cut those costs to just get to market and see whether the market cares about your feature or not. Okay, so so if I were to summarize this, Michael, you're basically saying, hey, don't invest too much in the beginning. Just hit the market with a quick POC, and if it pays off, you know, then go back and basically do it right, right? Do it the way it's meant to be, the way it's supposed to be. Did I get that right? Roughly, and my 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 full take is, you know, it depends. Yeah. Do a cost benefit analysis, and that's the obvious answer. Uh, yeah. I just think that there's always two forces pulling you. One is engineer the system better. You know, better engineering, if you get it for free, is never bad. Then yep. the other side is get to market because we're trying to build something for uh, actual users and we're not just trying to build the best system we can design in mm -hmm. the abstract. Okay. All right. Okay. Annie, what do you have to say about that? Awesome. So first, I'd love to say that, you know, again, thank you, Hassan. This is awesome. I have never done this before. Usually my Facebook debates are just like giant flame wars. So this is <laughs> way more healthier for me. I don't know what I'm going to do with my life now. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm really happy to have you. Go ahead. Go right. ahead. Mm -hmm. um, so I think everything Michael says is absolutely true. I agree with him. But I think there's levels of scale. Okay. So the reason... Michael's talking about features and time to ship is from a from from two points of view, right? One is you already have a product. And when he said there's a bunch of people in a room and they're really smart people, they know what to do and they're telling you what to do. That's a feature. Now, there are two issues with that. Let me first take a step back and then I'll zoom in on the micro. Okay. The macro issues are essentially that most functional people don't know what the technology is capable of. That's right. For example, they have seen that their competitor has released a server that can support, I'm talking in game terms, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. it can support a thousand users, concurrent users on one server. Yep. But there could be an algorithm or, or a way to do something such that the sharding is at tens of thousands of users. Yep. At that point, game designers can get completely different ideas. Now, yep. there is there are things to do with, with sort of creating good systems that, that just work well, that scale well, that are automated in that way, right? Yep. Automation simply doesn't mean take a process where you'd run a manual crank and attach yep. a motor to it. That's yep. a very crude definition of automation. Yep. To me, I think the there's a guy called um, Brad Abrams and Rico Mariani. Rico Mariani is sort of the primary architect of .NET and I think he said it the best. Nice. He called it the pit of success. The pit of success is that the idea is you make it hard for people to fail. So if I have a developer and I give him an automated system, or if I give a manual system, it's easy for a developer to fail with a manual system. If they want to add a feature, it's more likely that they'll encounter friction and therefore features will, get, will not get built. Uh, features are going to get harder. Some features can't even be imagined because there's no way you can get past that friction. But mm -hmm. when you have an automated system and when you have something that has very low friction, you tend to start thinking out of the box. You tend to try different combinations. You're more comfortable using that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's really sort of the macro scale. Now, on a micro scale, like per developer, um, there are two tiers to building a system, in my opinion. One's the foundation. Mm -hmm. And everything Michael said holds true for the superstructure. Yeah. Features get replaced, users can be fickle, no problem. But the point is, what are you building that feature on? Are you building that feature on a solid foundation that knows that here's the data stream? 
here's your data available to you on these platforms. You can support these clients. You have an API gateway already, or are you putting up an API gateway, adding the scaling and adding the feature at the same time? Uh -huh. Right. Uh -huh. So there's, there's that level of engineering. I think that's what's important is to me, automation is as much the ability for a developer to create something as it is for a feature to be present in a product. Right. Because right. products are only around as far as the money they make. Yeah. And that's great. That's, that's totally fine. But I honestly am not in it for the money. Um, I've been in it because I'm interested in it. And every time I make something, I do it primarily from the point of view that I'm advancing mm -hmm. something, a mm -hmm. small needle and pushing the needle, pushing the envelope just a little bit. Yeah. And to me, that's what's important is, did I make it easier to build that thing? Or did a designer come up with a brand new idea that was never done? Yeah. And let me give you an example of this, right? So I worked on, on some cloud streaming stuff and I was working on a racing game. Yep. Now, every single racing game out there, when they play on Twitch, you can see the back of the car, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that's great, but when you watch a Formula One race online, is that what you see? Like if, if literally every car had a camera on the back and that's yep. all you saw for the entire race, would that be interesting to you? Nope, no, it would no, not. Right, so so yeah. what I came up with was a, was a way to actually stream the physics data to an instance render the output on a separate thing and stream that. And that footage was cut across different cameras and followed the car and everything. Nice. So, nice. so the thing is, while honestly the feature was Twitch streaming, the reason for doing this and how it came about all came from an idea. Later, we used the exact same mechanism for generating you know, promo videos, uh, we use the exact same mechanism in another game for generating different views uh, mm -hmm. on the local system. So my point is, you unlock possibilities when you figure out a good foundation. Okay. And to me, a good foundation is also part of automation. If you have an IDE where you literally open it and you don't have to follow a bunch of fallible instructions, you're already better off than the person using Vim and trying to figure out, you know, like printf statements, and Where's the... debug it, right? So you're <laughs> already quit. better off. Exactly. <laughs> to me, there's levels of automation, and uh -huh. it's not always dollar amount. So while those matrix stuff works and it's great, if you're only looking to sell your product and you're not concerned about moving the needle, great. But if you're concerned about moving the needle, I think there's a foundational layer that that really needs to be considered, and that's where. I love to to actually talk about automation, and I will talk more about it in when the upcoming questions. But yeah, that's sort of my think. I think that yeah. this points to two things. First off, uh, you were talking kind of a little bit about a distinction between platform and features built on top of the platform, and Absolutely. I think that that is uh, a useful thing to think about. Um, teams building on top of a platform tend to be scrappier, shorter lived, and so on, whereas the platform is for longer times and needs to scale to all those users. So I Absolutely. definitely agree that there's a consideration there. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so I will say one thing about the platform, though, sorry to interrupt, but one thing about the platform, right? So it's not just that the, even if you have a foundation, it doesn't mean that the platform is scrappier. Okay. If you have a good foundation, building the platform becomes a joy because every developer only cares about that one thing they're doing they can black box it, they can unit test it, they have an IDE, they have this other system where you can check in with like literally no care once everything is green and yeah. you're like, yes, it will work. I know I'm guaranteed this. Yeah. Versus this other thing where there is a foundation of sorts and you're kind of scrappy building on top of it and you're like, wait, if I put this thing, am I gonna collapse the entire thing? Right? <laughs> you're like right. one second away from like a SEV2 or a set I can't one relate to that at all. That ever happens, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I can actually give you some more examples of this thing I, built on I, both I, sides. So. <laughs> So, so let me so, so let me just ask you both this question. You know, this is really important. This is a great segue. You know, there's a core a core point here that both of you are talking about. You know, let's let's go back to Michael on this. Michael, should should the quality of the software being built be only driven and dependent on the funding and the market 
or should engineers do their due diligence anyway to push the envelope forward, whether the product may have a potential or not? Uh, I'm sorry, that was not one of the approved questions from before. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't look it up on Stack Overflow. Ahead of time. That's right. Contact with a sneak attack over there. Boom. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> left and right. Uh, there's yeah, the, the easy answer is there's always a give and take, you know, there's value to both sides. So uh, I've definitely been in organizations where um, <clears throat> the concerns are more towards like product and what can be done very short term to move the product forward and then engineers have to fight for no let's tackle some technical debt let's automate some things and so on um <clears throat> and the answer is you have to consider both the short term and the long run of course mm -hmm. so you can always get some wins in the short term but if you compromise the long run you're going to have much more technical debt and a good engineer has enough experience to know which compromises you can make and which you shouldn't make, mm -hmm. uh, which leads into one of the questions that you did prepare us for. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, I'll let so that's, uh, so that's that. Well. Okay, Annie, what do you think? You know, should 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 the quality of engineering be only driven by market value and investment and funding and business because at the end of the day you know business might not be able to tell the difference between a page with a button and another page with a button one of them could be completely a, a disaster underneath that requires you know hundreds of thousands of dollars to add an extra one extra feature versus yeah. another page that looks exactly the same but it requires only like you know maybe a thousand dollars to add a new feature to it what do you what do you Absolutely. have to say about that and, and yeah, so first, I think that's that's absolutely right. I think, Michael, again, so I, I really think that this is great because there are sort of two skills that Michael and I are talking at. So let me first talk about my experience, right? The reason I'm talking from this perspective is that I was brought in usually for my entire career yeah. when a product didn't work anymore, like it couldn't scale. No matter how much resource you threw at it, it just wouldn't change. Yep. Like it was not a GPU based product. I wrote a GPU render for it. It did, couldn't run in the cloud and I made it, it run, run the cloud. in the cloud, it, you know, so, or it basically ran on a bunch of expensive Dell servers and they wanted to run it on cheap commodity GPUs. And I made sure that it worked, right? So nice. I usually come in at the point of breaking. Um, so again, that's it now. So that's my experience now. All that said, I agree that when you're making a prototype, yes, do it however you like, make sure that it works. I believe that you usually have to write a software four times mm -hmm. in order to actually get to something good. Mm -hmm. The first time you're just figuring out what to do. Yep. You don't care how you're just doing it. And the second time you know what to do and you've seen the problems that happen and you're basically fixing those problems. Yep. And the third time you understand how everything is put together. And then you're sort of building this foundation that actually stands on and oh, then you, you yeah. know what the components are. You put the components together. The yep. fourth time you get the components, you can understand the data flow. That's when you actually really understand it. Now, usually people don't have the luxury to do it four times. Mm -hmm. which is really where experience comes in. Yep. And yep. this is where you, this is why you have people who work at the foundation um, have a lot of experience doing this stuff four times before, and mm -hmm. then they come and do it. Now, if you hire a bunch of new grads to build this large system and build the foundation, you get what you get. I, I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> you get what you you're looking for. <laughs> yeah. You, the, what you pay for, you get exactly what you pay for. But this is why you build you build the the foundation using really experienced engineers who've seen the three times before, and you're building the fourth time. Now, um, another corollary that I've kind of accumulated over my entire experience is that the total amount of work required to build a software is the same across its lifetime. Yeah. Whatever that lifetime may be in terms of in terms of you know a dollar amount. Now you can choose to throw expensive engineers, but a few of them up in the front and put that work in and have the 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 tickets and the maintenance costs taper off and have more junior engineers deal with it toward the bottom where you have more you know you have a real framework you, those guys don't have to deal with base classes or like architectural concerns or 
you can start with sort of mid-level engineers and not you know give them the time or the money or whatever right but basically it's sort of a time into money proposition yep. and then you basically either have a longer curve that either ramps up because you have more friction the more features you add yep. or if it's a short lifetime you sort of have to maintain it with the constant effort pushing through that friction at each step for a longer time mm -hmm. the total amounts the same you have to decide what is better for you if you believe it's a product that evolves then i've always gone for the uh the, the thing where you put in a lot of work up front and then it tapers off toward the, toward the end yeah. and i can give examples but i'd like you to that's sort of the point i'd like to make and i have a good example for it if you're interested but please summarize and we can continue we'll ask you about examples very shortly go ahead michael you want to say something yeah just as a I, I wouldn't even call it a counterpoint because i don't know that we have any fundamental disagreement but Let's say a counterpoint because then it's more interesting to the viewers. Uh, awful people like Ani. No, okay. <laughs> I.e., anyone that disagrees with me. No. Um, an interesting thing that Hassan posted in a few of the Facebook groups that he posts in, or maybe it was just one, and I just saw it several times. Uh, it's that all the top companies you see today were built by junior engineers. So. Mm -hmm. We kind of threw junior engineers a little bit under the bus there when we said upfront costs with uh, seniors versus juniors. Seniors do it better, kind of. Uh, I'm paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the companies we see today are built by junior engineers, which is, I think, a pretty interesting point, which is you can start from an experience, build something, and as long as you get a foothold in the market where the product is useful, you can, you can go from there. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that I wanted to address from what Ani said was... Uh, she has historically been brought in when a product uh, can't scale pretty much, like can't can't get to the next step. Uh, and I think that, of course, that that impacts her perspective. And I would totally like have a much more uh, automation leaning perspective uh, if that was the cases where if those were the cases where I was brought in. And there's a feeling sometimes in software development, software development that the, per, the, the solution to fix the current problem was brought in just at the right time. So like the yep. system just can't scale and you just made it able to scale more. Yeah. And that intuitively doesn't feel good, but maybe it's not that bad actually. So maybe the solution to a problem should be brought when it becomes a problem. Uh -huh. um, when we try to automate or scale systems being, before we know their use cases, how they need to scale and so on, we don't know how to automate them and scale them. So I'm not saying that the systems were perfect until you got there and then you made them a little more perfect. I'm saying that um, like maybe a lot of the knowledge that we use to automate things comes from having them start to slowly grind down and break down a little bit and seeing where the good points for scaling are, right? Because we don't, when we deploy a service, we don't scale all the services That's right. uh, that it depends on by the same amount. We yep. We roll out a little bit. We see, oh, okay, the traffic spikes this way. This is called a hundred times more. So let's scale that more, something like that. Um, so I think that the the final conclusion of this whole discussion is going to be, you know, it always depends. Use experience. <laughs> people who, uh, and, and that's that's actually a good segue. I, I want to make this point. It is about experience, right? Yeah. When he when when Michael says something like, we don't know which feature is going to scale, but you do because you have this person that's worked on similar systems. Yeah. Now, yeah. I will tell you this, there are very few parts of a system that are truly novel, truly, truly novel. If you tell me that a person that built an at scale net Snapchat and saw all the issues with it or built the at scale Twitch and built, uh, had saw issues with it, couldn't go build another streaming service, despite the fact that this amazing product person came up with this super cool tagline and this vc was like all in you know yeah great get your y combinator funding do your jazzy <laughs> stuff but honestly the core of the problem remains how are you going to stream what yeah. protocols are you going to use what services are you going to deploy how are you going to containerize or scale those services how are you going to log everything so you can actually see metrics what is your sort of on-call structure how do you want to deal with tickets how do you want to deal with alarms That's where true. are your metrics coming from right what points do you put for scaling so that you can do the variable scaling we talked about later now yep. that's where the experience comes in and i think 
I'm not, I'm not, not to belittle uh, junior engineers at all, but I think the point is not about junior or senior, right? The point is, have you seen that thing before? Yeah. As with anything, if you yep. haven't seen something, you're going to take a little while to figure out what it is. I give you a doodad. Yeah. You've never seen it before. And I say, do this thing with it. You could figure it out. Sure. Yep. But it's going to take a while. You might break something if it's, yep. if it's delicate. But if you've seen a similar doodad before, you're going to push the right you know, buttons. Yep. You're going to turn the right knobs. And that is what I mean by experience, not just senior versus principal. Titles are meaningless. Titles yep. are about how, I, I don't know if I can say this on air, but <laughs> how, how good you are at sort of brown nosing your way up the chain, right? <laughs> You've heard of the Peter principle. Everybody stops at sort of this level where they're not effectual anymore. So I, I don't care about titles. It is about experience I, and experience is different from titles. I, I, I think true software engineers follow principles regardless of the titles. I think fancy ideas are not exclusive on people with fancy titles. You know, I think Absolutely. that, you know, if I go and say, oh, you know, John is a junior and, you know, Jane is a principal and I'm just preferring Jane's opinion based on that. That's that's yeah. a that's a form that I've seen in a lot of organizations called, you know, elitism. Right. You're basically yeah. just giving someone a heads up sure. just merely based on their title, which does not mean does not mean anything in any way, shape or form. Let me take this back to Michael. Michael. You know, okay, so you're saying there might be situations where it's okay to cut corners, you know, to hit the market. What are these corners? Give us some examples, something you've lived and seen, you know, yourself. Go ahead. What a great question. And I have just the list to answer. <laughs> First off, I want to say, I don't know if titles are just uh, proof of how well you can brown nose, because if, if that was the case, I, think I would be a CEO at that point, and I'm not. So I can't be better. Uh, better. better. <laughs> no, no, I just spend more time here. Trust me. There's, there's, a reason, there's a reason I'm a senior after 22 years. Let's just say that. <laughs> I, I would have been farther if I was good at it. Trust me. Trust me on this. All right, go ahead, Michael. Give it to me. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'll give some examples of corner corners you can cut, corners you probably shouldn't cut, and then cases where uh, when to cut corners. Okay. Um, and so corners to cut, as an example, first off, address the biggest chunk of the market first. So let's say you have you're you're building some kind of platform to integrate with commerce uh systems which is what i'm kind of doing right now but so we have we integrate kind of with shopify with woocommerce big commerce and a bunch of other things that provide various parts of the mm -hmm. um, shopping experience to sellers and to buyers and uh shopify is probably one of our biggest ones so it yep. makes sense to focus on shopify first so that's okay. one in quote corner to cut even the and i put it in quotes because corner to cut is often like product decision made by pms uh -huh. and isn't even a corner that an engineer chooses to cut but one is address the biggest chunk of the market first then you have things like um, issues or bad states that are fixable when you refresh or retry okay. um, i think historically at meta there was some thought of like issues that can be fixed with the refresh aren't a big deal because you can just refresh and fix them yeah personally yeah they're they're annoying but if i can refresh and fix it it's not that bad um uh, then okay. any feature that's expensive to implement, but easy to hack and doesn't immediately need to scale. So here's an example. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> we have an internal tool to override a user, an employee's uh, location so that they can test the shop as if they're from a different country. Okay. And recently we had a, one of our support uh, partners come in and say, it doesn't work for me. And so I looked into it and then deep down the stack, it turns out that um, the reason why it doesn't work is that the tool only works for employees and the system was not recognizing her as an employee for this specific purpose, for whatever mm. reason. Well, we didn't own the tool and the logic that determines who's an employee or not. We had a hard uh -huh. time finding who it is. Um, and eventually another engineer on my team took it on and had the idea of, okay, let's put a if condition uh, behind the gatekeeper, so that, which is essentially a feature switch or like in Microsoft terms, a big red switch. If the user is this person, they're an employee. <laughs> and, uh, that's such a huge hack, but I also think it's brilliant because we didn't, know how, we didn't know how to fix it. And this just unblocks the person. They can do their job mm. um, and then we can move on. And then if 
uh, if they're also not considered an employee for some other purpose, they would have told us like, I can't access any employee tools. If other employees also didn't have access to the tool, they'd tell us. And maybe there is some huge underlying bug there that we just haven't addressed, but I think it's a pretty, pretty neat idea that, that he came up with. But, but, but let me ask you this. Did anyone ever go back to fix it? Because there's a little, a little point in there. This is what I always say, you know, like, you know, software engineers, you know, for the most part, especially the ones who are, you know, kind of, okay, let me just, you know, get it done for now and we'll come back to it later. There is no later. Nobody comes back to fix anything. In fact, you know, historically and statistically speaking, you know, software engineers will go fix something and be like, oh, I don't even have the energy to go back to deal with this thing. And then guess what? The next day, business is coming in with more features to pile up on top of this hacky stuff, you know, that already been developed. And that's how you end up with people with depression. You know, I think I feel like this is a business of giving therapists, you know, more patience just to deal with. Well, I always say bad code is a health hazard, right? So let me let me ask you this. What do you say to people that say, oh, we're going to come back to fix it, but it never happens. Like 22 years now, you know, I'm, I feel like in this room, just this channel right here, we have at least half a, a, a century of experience in the tech industry. Does it ever happen, Michael? Do people ever come back and fix shit? Go ahead. Uh, first off, don't give away my age on a uh, public. <laughs> Let me stop you right there, sir. <laughs> I just graduated. <laughs> uh, I'm 20 years young. <laughs> good, 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 good. No, I, I totally agree. Later, later equals never. I'm a huge proponent of this. Just the other day, I was looking at some code, and it says to do. When we switch to this formulation of this function, we can remove this. And I there's this handy dandy feature at Meta where you just move the mouse to the right and it tells you the diff that added that line. And that was added nine years ago. So oh I totally Lord. understand. Uh, it, it, and it's not a critical thing. Like it's not like we're yes, some weird sure. for nine years. But I totally agree that later equals never. Uh, going back on, on the other side, going back to what I said earlier, where uh, features get unshipped. Maybe the person will stop working and move on to a different company before the problem comes up again. No, and, and that's a joke, but it's kind of also true. Um, so there's also a backlog of other bugs that we need to address right. as well. And so the, it's not that we aren't going back to fix it because uh, we did a little hack and we moved on. It's just that it's just not at the top of our priorities, and we'd have no evidence that it's that it's a, it's a big issue. But I agree. If you if you make some significant trade-off, then you better have a good plan for paying down your technical debt. If it's a small thing, then you can get away with it. Okay. Um, and then I have so, some more things. And I, I think I'll soon get to the corners that you shouldn't cut. And I think that those are also interesting. Um, but to just quickly finish up the corners that you can cut, depending on the specific experience that you're building for users, there's various things that you can always decide to drop. Search functionality, autocomplete, recommendations engine, uh, depending on whether you're talking about a platform thing that you're building, as you, you were talking about before, Ani, or like more feature-oriented thing, then latency and performance are sometimes corners that you can cut. Sometimes you can get away with uh, making users wait 30 seconds by just having a little loading screen that has four stages that said like compiling your data, processing your requests, blah, blah. And it's weirdly effective that people are willing to sit through it, and it's a, it's a cool little hack. Of course, go back and fix it, but sometimes you can trade off on latency. Uh, and then for POCs, scalability also. Um, okay. Okay. I want to give a quick example here from the real world because you wanted some examples that are real yeah. world yeah. before going to uh, corners that you shouldn't cut. And that is if you read about the stories of a lot of startups, you see a lot of these things where corners are cut. So for example, DoorDash, when they first started, mm -hmm. I'm guessing many people know the story. If I remember correctly, they just they wanted to build an app that was like DoorDash, but they didn't know if there was a market for it. So they just put the phone number there to, to call or to text, and then they manually delivered all the orders themselves, the founders with a, with a couple of friends. And it was all manual, the whole thing. There was no app. It was all yeah. of these people. Um, <laughs> and so they cut the whole app out of the, <laughs> the question. And it seemed like, to me, I think that that's the right approach at that point in their development. I'm okay. uh, not saying that DoorDash should continue to run as a zero code uh, yep. enterprise. No code, low code, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, okay. So, so Michael, <laughs> this is. I wanted to get to corners that you shouldn't cut just quickly. 
Okay. Uh, and so some examples there are security. You should probably never cut security. Like if you know there's an SQL injection vulnerability, fix it right now. Yep. Uh, if you know that there's some privacy leak, drop everything else, fix it right now. Um, other ones are critical correctness. So finance, health, safety. So like if you uh, are processing stock transactions and there's a 10% chance that you're going to add 20% on top of the transaction randomly, that's a critical thing. And you, your product should be on shift if that's an issue. Like literally you should flip a switch and turn off whatever functionality you're working on until you can fix it. Uh, yeah. Health, if you're working with, if you're making AI for surgeons, uh, there's there's no room for error there. Maybe there's, who knows, but there's very little room for error there. Uh, mm -hmm. Safety things like an elevator, uh, don't, don't have like <laughs> try catch conditions that have a to do in the catch condition, <laughs> not condition, but catch block. Yeah. So overall, the framework for thinking of when to cut corners is when you're small, either as a company or a product or a feature, when the stakes are low, and when your failure is not publicized or has a big outside impact. Okay. All right. Annie. Awesome. Like, okay. It's like Annie has yeah, something this to is, say this about is, that. This is, really, this is really a matter of scale again. So I again, again, the thing is, Michael comes from a very feature-oriented place, right? And I'd love to take some of his examples and turn it around if possible. Yeah. So one of the things we took, we spoke about was this big red switch. If user is blah, then do this. Now, the fix itself is not the problem. And I think this is where most people come, like how they think. The person that initially decided to take foreign data from a system with no interface in between this thing, where you could just inject a new implementation that read from some table or something and did this data-driven replacement of yes, no, that guy's the problem. <laughs> right. And this is, so, so the thing is when shit hits the fan, mm -hmm. if you have no way to clean up said thing, yeah. then you do what you can. And, and the, that's the problem is again, this comes back to sort of foresight and experience, you know, when you look at a system, what pieces are likely to be points of friction? Yeah. And people that understand this tend to build interfaces. Maybe they have the most crappiest implementation. Again, another example that Michael brought up, right? Yeah. Performance and loading screens. Now, I don't care that my implementation of a loader, data loader, is literally naive. It's going file by file, opening file stream and reading everything sequentially, not even threads, right? Nothing at all. It doesn't deal with anything. Fine, that's implementation A. But the fact that I have a standard data loader interface, mm -hmm. sorry? I was, I said, you guys use threads? What are those? <laughs> it's oh, just yeah, joking. Yeah. Don't, don't worry, he's right. just joking. Exactly. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, yeah, no, threads, yeah, anyway, threads, what a, what a very, no, I'm joking. Uh, so the thing is, the, the person that makes that piece has to think about the fact that today, I have a suboptimal implementation. How can somebody swap it out without tearing down the entire system on top? Mm -hmm. That is key to me, right? Mm -hmm. And I think features can be built on top of both things. Lifetimes is the same. The dollar amounts are the same. Everything's the same. But the point is, the fact that you, you, you have this interface in between you, what you know to be suboptimal today and the fact that that's the only thing you can build. Again, the DoorDash example. Now, SMS is great. Why? Because tomorrow, but again, but my point is if they've taken their personal number, which is not some sort of scalable, yeah. um, automatable SMS and, and done it everything from their phone, maybe tomorrow they can't transfer that number to mm -hmm. AWS or whatever, portability mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. But if they would said, you know what, today we're going to do everything manually, but we're going to get this number only for that guy. And we're going to make sure that tomorrow we can scale to an AWS sort of SMS system that then does everything. That's foresight. You yeah. can still absolutely do everything manually. You can have the worst implementation, you can settle for everything, but it takes foresight and it takes experience to see where to put those interfaces. Mm -hmm. And I have actually an example is I had this, uh, this client and I was writing this uh, video, sort of a VDI interface where it was 
remote rendering and they were doing some CAD stuff over the uh, over here. Mm -hmm. And my process was doing all the capture, all the transcoding, all the KVM integration, all of that stuff. Now, right. they wanted some very specific uh, way to channel the inputs and specific uh, options to happen on the frame encoding uh -huh. for a particular demo. Now, nobody's going to use this stuff because it was a very specific demo scenario. They needed that. Now, usually, and this came at like, what, 2 a.m. and I got a page on my thing. This was back in AWS days, guys. So, yeah, I was pretty stressed out. Uh -huh. um, now, normally, I'd be like, I can't do it. It's not possible. Uh -huh. But I said, you know what? Just, just wait. Hold on. And I knew sort of the thing where I say, yes, you need encoding options. So I basically put an encoder interface, I encoder, and I uh -huh. had two different implementations of that. So I had only the one, which was the basic thing, which just passed the frame in. Right, right. All I had to do was take that guy, add essentially a subclass of the implementation that I had, overwrite a couple of methods and write only the scaling bits yep. and add a couple of configuration flags to it. And now my new implementation could not only access those flags, those flags were backward compatible because the other implementation nice. would ignore them. Nice. And I was able to do this between 2 to 4, 4 a.m. in nice. two hours, and it worked. So no shade, like, no shade on sort of saying, you know, yes, you need to build this quickly. Do it. But knowing how to build it so you can actually change stuff later and you don't have uh... this big red switch, that, I think, is the corner you can't cut. So... So all corners on the superstructure, not on the foundation. Right. So Michael, so basically Annie's Annie's basically talking about something really important. Said there are things you can cut corners on if you're like how you implement an iteration over some list that you retrieve from a database, you can be the least optimal, you know, as you want. But there are some things like the design, the low-level architecture, how you architect your software, even if you're gonna put garbage in every component, literally just chaos after chaos, as long as the overall design architecture, because you know, a long time ago, actually, one of my mentors, you know, he reached out to me and he said, you know, Hassan, know for sure that code bugs are cheap design bugs are really really expensive Very good point. to kind of revert Very good point. What, do, what do you have to say about that michael go ahead tell that to the left parentheses i missed a few days ago <laughs> 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 uh, don't code it vim michael this is what happens when you code it like vim or whatever <laughs> uh, lisp excuse me <laughs> lisp. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, this was before my time. I've heard that it's a thing from XKCD. It might be a fake language. Who knows? <laughs> right. no, I think I think that what Ani said, if the, if there's a highlight of the video, it should be what what Ani said earlier, which is that uh, knowing where to put the interface uh, is is the most important thing. And I think that's that, that's spot on. Um, you can put whatever garbage you want behind an interface as long as it's behind an interface. And a lot of the a lot of the things that I run into working on a platform ET and kind of at meta is working with legacy code that was written like two or three years ago uh, and making changes across all that code. So we're introducing some unified visibility framework for uh, handling whether a shop should be visible to users or not. And so mm -hmm. there's places in the client, places in the Instagram server, places in the meta server, uh, or the, the dub 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 Facebook server that have all all have scattered logic, and if someone had at some point thought like maybe visibility is going to be a complex thing that we should put behind one entry point, we would have well we wouldn't have had this work. So thank them for job security. But uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but, okay. but it would have been better. So yeah, knowing where to put the interface, predicting like taking a moment to think is this going to grow in uh, in complexity or not. On the other hand, I also think that interfaces are sometimes hard to make. So like um, I'm working on, on some other things where I'm connecting to, not as part of work, but like connecting to a Cosmos DB database and I'm choosing what kind of operations to do based on the capabilities that I know Cosmos has. Uh. And so kind of the implementation is specific based on the, the database I'm using. And if I went like, super abstract on it and i would lose that control over how things get implemented so there's sometimes not a perfect it's way not an easy problem to so, yeah yeah so an interface hides necessarily some of the stuff that is relevant so uh, not this is not to d detract from to, from ani's point but just to 
say that it's that it's complex to do. But I, you you guys are uh, principal engineers, and I'm just a lowly senior, so I'm sure that you have the experience <laughs> for it. Uh, yeah. We already spoke about titles, Michael. Yeah, but yeah. But, but, we're just okay. better at brown nosing. That's that's the conclusion. <laughs> we've agreed on that, and we've moved on. Yeah. Sorry, my bad. Okay. Okay. So so hear me out. You know. You know, I want to shift us kind of to another topic and another question in here. Mm -hmm. You know, the topic about, you know, properly engineered systems and their impact on the business today, right? Mm -hmm. Their impact on the business, you know, is everything else just a sunk cost? You know, what do you feel about that? Let's go to Annie first this time, right? Okay, awesome. Um, so, yes, um, I would say again that it depends again on sort of which scale you're looking at. Mm -hmm. And sometimes also it depends on whether you're working with a large body of legacy code that you cannot by any means change or like whether you're working with a new system. Now, because we're talking about properly engineering systems, I'm going to assume that it's some sort of greenfield with some prior knowledge about what we're doing at least, because mm -hmm. if it is a legacy system, it is what it is. You are going to have to patchwork. So I'm not going to talk about properly engineering in that context. Now, yep. this actually brings back a really nice anecdote to one of my very earliest days. And this is honestly somebody else that, that worked on it. Like we worked on it as a small team. I was in this tiny company that specialized with uh, Borland uh, Delphi uh, oh, way back when. Okay. I was a huge Borland fan. I started with Turbo Pascal and years and years. So I worked with Delphi a lot. Um, so I'm, I'm, that was sort of my design introduction. And I learned a lot of good things about design from it. But overall, the project involved making hundreds of reports for this ERP sort of organization. And again, we had this database that was fairly specific to certain things and all that stuff. We also had purchased this reporting component. You know how you purchase component packs back then, like for WinForms and for Delphi? We purchased the whole reporting pack and everything. So they had their own like format, so you could go do stuff, and then when you ran it, it would run the Delphi code behind, go mm -hmm. fetch the data and populate it, and then show the reports. Now, we had about six months to build this entire system, and we had mm -hmm. hundreds of reports to build, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And all the product people were like, oh, let's go into this field of this report and decide how to make this graph look beautiful. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the main engineer on that, this wasn't me, actually. I was fairly junior at the time. I didn't have the experience uh, that he did. Um, he essentially started by saying, you know what? Let those designers haggle about all this stuff and let them talk about everything. We're not going to do this. What we ended up doing was we built an in-program, in-ERP report designer. Oh my God. We basically used T-Control at runtime, subclassed it, and we showed the grab handles by changing the, the wind style. Uh, and, you know, we basically took the client hits and turned it into non-client hits and all of that stuff. And then we used the DFM serialization, which is the Delphi form serialization, to serialize the report. And then at runtime, we created that those components that the reporting system used. We also plugged in sort of this little scripting engine, which allowed us to do complex operations and gather data. What this basically meant was for the first three months, we'd produce no report, mm. nothing that, that, that either the client or sort of our, our managerial types yep. could see. Yep. People were like, people were losing it. People were just like, they were just going crazy. They were, they were like, well, what's going on? This is nuts. So, but then at the end of three months, we created three reports the toughest ones. We said, all those other ones be damned. By the way, in those three months, if we had started building, let's say 50 reports, those 50 would have changed anyway, because the designers and the guys, they hash it out, they started changing things. So it's a good thing we didn't build it. Yeah. If yeah. we had gone that route, we'd have to go back and change That's those right. again. That's Instead, right. we just built the top three using this tool. And you know, we actually ended up selling this for a larger amount of money to the client because nice. now they could create as many reports as they wanted. We ended up having a program to actually educate their users on an ongoing basis on how to use this tool. And the best part for the rest of those three months, we came to work and we played Star Wars Pod Racer <laughs> and we went home. And we nice. did a few things. 
And we answered a couple of emails saying, oh, you want this stuff? Oh, we'll just write this little script component. Nice. And it was barely any work. We had no bugs. Nice. And the designers were like, wow, now I can create these awesome graphs. How do I do this thing? Oh, yeah, you just have to use the script function and we'll bind it for you and then we're done. So nice. essentially, I think that's what really kind of clicked in my head is you can create brand new business impact from an idea. Yeah. It's sort of like your capacitive touchscreen, right? Yeah. When we had resistive touchscreens, nobody cared. Yeah. But then because there was a hardware that was capable of detecting multiple touch points, somebody said, damn, this is a great gesture. You, know, <laughs> you, can, right. you can zoom in. That's right. Not because of the fact that they came up with the pinching gesture that nope. the capacitive screen got, was yeah, yeah. Exactly. And I think that is where true innovation happens. And that is where business value is impacted. I, I agree about sort of, you know, saying that startups happen because of money and all that stuff. But if you look at every big company today, they didn't start by building a company. They mm -hmm. started by building something cool. Yeah. That yep. was truly true. innovative. Yep. It turned into Google. It turned into Facebook. Yep. It turned into the things that it turned into. Yep. If people yep. that build companies knowing that they're going to be acquired are sort of at a, you know, they hit a ceiling. They don't so, go anywhere. They don't push anything. They don't change anything. Essentially. So I think that's sort of where I'm talking about is you properly engineer. Proper engineering means diff different things to different people. Um, and sometimes you can go beyond at the foundations that will give you new horizons versus you know thinking in inside the box of the business requirements i've never done that i yeah. usually tend to create my own projects and give them ideas on how to proceed so yes. that's my perspective it might it might be very colored but that is mine no that no you know i i really appreciate by, by the way both of you have some some passion and dedication i really i really really appreciate this it just shows more than just you guys are not just you're not employees <laughs> you know you're 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 addicted to this. This is a craft to you. You know, this is something that you apply yourself through. But then let's take it back to Michael. Michael, again, you know, is there any value in properly engineering system, even if it doesn't have an immediate business impact? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, that, that cut it short. <laughs> you're gonna make you gonna make any joke the water. Okay, we're all done now. Yeah. Michael's done. <laughs> have a good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, I, I'm going to start with uh, an attempt at getting the, the second most useful maybe quote in, 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 the, in the interview, because I don't think I can top Anis on, on interfaces. And that's uh, in an organization that's very focused on shipping fast, be the voice for automation, standardization, and good engineering. Uh, in an organization that's super focused on good engineering, standardization, automation, big monolithic things that are super well designed, be the voice for shipping faster. Right. Uh, and I think that that guideline kind of won't put you too far astray because chances are that your org has over-optimized in some way and pulling it back in the other direction uh, is going to be good. Now, uh, to answer your question well, about properly engineered systems, I want to kind of first talk about the term properly and properly engineered because there's a lot of wiggle room in the term properly engineered because whether something is proper, in my opinion, depends on its purpose. Uh, a knife that's meant to be used to eat like gas station lasagna is properly engineered. If it's cheap, it cuts the soft lasagna and it breaks down easily after its end of life. Whereas a knife that's meant to be used to do something like cut a high-end steak at a restaurant is properly engineered. If it's durable, it's sharp, and it probably looks good. So I'd argue that properly engineered is relative to the circumstances of use of the system and that there isn't necessarily one best proper engineering or like even a, a certain set of best properly engineered systems for a given problem in the abstract without like considering how they get used and so on. And also I want to make a distinction between ideal and optimal solutions. Uh, so to me, an ideal system is the system that you would, or the solution that you would build if you had no constraints, whereas the optimal one is what you would, is the best solution that you can build given the constraints you face and the trade-offs you have. And so to me, properly engineered systems are the latter about optimal solutions rather than ideal solutions. In the context of your question, the implications are that, uh, they should be properly engineered systems should be strongly driven by business impact. 
Um, this is not to say that you should never make any considerations outside of it. You certainly should, and there's certainly value in engineers taking a stand for better engineered systems, for things that are better abstracted, so on. Uh, not having an if check for the employee ID to make them override their uh, location to. to uh, um, right. But so I think there's obvious benefits to to pushing for better engineering. Uh, and we discussed a lot of them before, I think, in the in the costs and the benefits of uh, uh, automation and stuff. And I think that while we're always going to find reasons why more automation is necessary for this or for that feature to work, and it, it really will be, it, it is true, um, pushing for look for automation is useful. And indeed, at Meta, we, um, we reward few people for better engineering, which is essentially automation related, how to make changes at scale more easily. But on the flip side, there's another consideration that's also useful. And that is, I've seen many junior engineers come out of college thinking that they need to create the ultimate engineered system. Mm -hmm. uh, and they run into analysis paralysis. So they optimize for use, case, use cases that features won't hit. Um, they build very the rabbit holes, yeah. yeah, like so many layers of abstraction and so on. And they're very smart engineers and they learned everything in college, but they just haven't gotten their product legs yet. And so for many of the projects that I've been on, my intuition and others' intuition has been to think of engineering systems first. Mm -hmm. And then more senior engineers or managers have pulled us back and says, said, OK, but how do we ship this faster? Do we need the whole thing? Um, do we know the full value of this feature? Can we build a subset of it? And I think that to that extent, it's possibly the more important mindset for engineers to have sometimes, or at least to pull them back from the other side. Because as engineers, we get very comfortable when executing on coding tasks, looking at code, exploring engineering solutions, re-architecting systems, refactoring things. That's great, and so on. But I would say that we often get too comfortable and that we need more of a product focus and drive. Um, yeah. It's a very long, long question to, uh, long answer to, is there value in better in uh, properly engineered systems? And yes, there is value, but of course, um, you need to know where you are on this scale. Are you over-engineering or are you focusing too much on the short-term impact? So and there's a middle ground. There's always a Yeah, exactly. Ground. I mean I mean that comes I mean, from experience. Right. The the ideal like building the perfect system is a heaven that has no limit. And also building a terrible system is a hole that has no limit. You know, let me let me tell you how I see this, right? If I come to you and I tell you build me a car you know, engineer a car for me. It shouldn't matter whether I'm going to take this car to war or take it for a picnic. You should build a car that's properly engineered and designed. How do you feel about that? No, that, I think that's the most disagreeable statement I've heard so okay. far. Okay, great. Uh, okay. Because I don't think Ani has been disagreeing. <laughs> like, I don't disagree with pretty much anything that Ani has said at all. Uh, but I, I mean, maybe mm -hmm. I'm totally misunderstanding what, what you've said, but a mm -hmm. car that goes to war and a car that goes to picnic are totally different cars. Uh, right. A car that was achievable in the 1920s and a car that was achie that's achievable now are also totally different. And if you try to build today's cars in 1920, the cost would be so astronomical because yep. you would just yep. need to re-engineer -engine so many of the things to eventually get there. So yep. I don't I don't agree with that. All right. So Annie, I how do would you actually sort of start from sort of a foundational aspect of it, right? Sort of, are we talking about terrain? Are we talking about longevity? Are we talking about armored exterior, mm -hmm. right? So, so the thing is, it all depends. Mm -hmm. And what I really like to look at today, and I'm, I'm a big car buff, so I, I love looking at this stuff, is there are these things called platforms, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Platforms are essentially this little skateboard with a battery, motors, the drive train, um, and any sort of onboard electronics, power, power converter for the battery pack, all of that stuff. Right. That I think is a great example. Mm -hmm. Now there have been, you know, like like there are companies that take those and turn them into those Dubai sort of tanks where people take them <laughs> dune bashing. Uh -huh. And I don't know about war, so I'll talk about dune bashing as sort of my upper example. Uh -huh. Versus taking it and turning it into sort of a GLS sort of thing where you drive around, you know, suburban soccer mom, and you're like driving around. You can still do that thing you do with the air suspension, <laughs> where you're going like shake, shake, shake. But the point is. The platform remains the same. Yeah. The yeah. weight distribution is correct. Yeah. You know whether you chose to have one gear or two gears, so you know your gear ratio is right. You know sort of what is your charging curve. Yeah. And I think that's where it, 
things happen, right? It's about experience. Yeah. Again, I, I, this is my point. I'm not trying to make 10 different points. I think I've answered the same thing to all of your questions. Mm -hmm. It is about how you know a product can be built. If you've built a car and you realize that tomorrow I, I can't accelerate because I don't have the capability to do at least two gear ratios or I don't have the torque, then you'll build something with two. If you realize that, hey, I'm charging really slow because I'm running at sort of a 200 volt architecture, I need to go to 700. If I go to 700, I'll have thinner gauge wires. If I have thinner gauge wires, I'll have these sorts of different magnetic characteristics. And I think that's experience, right? You sort of not only see what, but you, as soon as you look at sort of a problem that's a product person throwing at you, you start seeing the solution. And I don't know how to explain this. Honestly, I really can't explain it. But if I looked at sort of somebody telling me I need a fast charging car that can go from here to there, I will start talking about skateboards. Yep. I will start talking about power yep. converters. I will start talking about <laughs> your voltage architecture. I will talk about the software that you need or yep. whether you need sort of a, you know, what, what is the, what is the lowest kind of suspension you could build such that you could still build some sort of a differential or yeah. a floating rear tomorrow. But at the same time, you have this lower end version that can have a, a fixed uh, spring suspension. So yep. Yep. I think that's really where I come from is it's not about what you can do in the time that's given to you. It's about what you can imagine. And then you sort of start saying, okay, fine. I need to build only these pieces, but because that is my sort of end goal, I'm going to box all these things and make sure I can do it tomorrow and I'll keep them in, in my mind. And sometimes if I can't build it, I will put up a giant red flag. Yep. I have been known to send a mail to, you know, all the way up to VP saying, we are making this decision today. Hereby, let it be known that we have <laughs> made this decision. It is a yep. one way door and we cannot go past it. Yeah. Okay. So that tomorrow, <laughs> if anyone comes and asks me, I'll be like, Hey, I sent you that email. I dude. told you. <laughs> I can't, I told I can't you do anything so. about it. Yeah. So that seeing one way doors is a very important skill that you get as part of experience. And I think it dictates a lot of how we build systems. Younger engineers have not seen those doors before. So when they go through it, they're like, Oh, green fields on the other side. It's great. But then you can't go back. Yeah, no matter whether it was a mirage like or not, you can't Wonderland. go back. It's over. Absolutely. So, so, so on the topic of chaos versus standardization, like, you know, when I talk to the two of you, you talk about something in the middle. There is an aspect of this that always gets forgotten, right? When, when you cut corners, even if these cutting corners is justified for you to hit the market so fast, mm -hmm. it's always forgotten the, the negative impact, you know, this chaotic code has on the engineers maintaining the system imagine like you know you are an engineer who is joining the tech industry you know and okay the business and the senior engineers have made all the right decisions to hit the market and get a product going but there's still this little guy that comes in that has to clean up all of this and clean up this garbage and if this was thoughtfully engineered and designed from the beginning you know, uh, these individuals uh, would not need or engineers, uh, you know, junior engineers wouldn't have to deal with this. Why is this aspect uh, not being factored in into decisions like these? Go ahead, Mike. Just get wrecked, noob. That's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm that meta stock, right? <laughs> Go ahead. Well, the, the easy answer is the organization has gone too far in, in one direction. Mm -hmm. uh, so it comes back to experience, know when you're building too much technical debt and have an eye out for, um, for, for technical debt, the, the size, the, the risk that it creates for the future and the burden that it creates on the people that need to maintain it as you, as you point out. Um, okay. but one, one brief thing that I want to challenge kind of is that I think that, um, there's like we when we build a good system a properly engineered system we think okay this is properly engineered but from another perspective it could be very under engineered so let's say that you build the best possible api and the latest version of dotnet uh and then someone comes in and says 
well, actually, you could have written it in uh, C++ and it would be two times faster and that would make it better engineered. But then you would say like, well, the rest of my system is not C++. And I said, well, yes, but a properly engineered system includes a, a service that interrupts, does interrupt between C Sharp and C++, like Thrift or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and you're like, well, then we would need to build that. Like, well, yes, that would be the properly engineered system. So I would, I would argue that even systems that you think are properly engineered, one might say are not properly engineered enough. So we're always cutting some kind of corner. Yeah, yeah, but, but let me always interject here. <laughs> let me interject here from my experience, right? You know, mm -hmm. the teams, you know, that I work with, leading teams and working with that, you know, if you have a philosophy and a standard that the team agrees on, you know, it doesn't matter what the technology that you're using is or what's faster and what's slower. You know, a team that has a proper standard for how they build their components and their systems is a team that is, you know, set up for success and really, really is isolated from incidents where they have to deal with chaotic code that causes them all kinds of, you know, uh, uh, mental breakdowns and depressions. And, you know, inevitably it will impact the product, but the, okay, the product, you can get something working for the product anyway. I am more focused about the engineers. You know, like when you say properly engineered system, if you agree, if you have like an agreement with the team and the organization that you're working with, okay, here's how we're gonna standardize our system. This is our, you know, uh, uh, way and philosophy of doing this, that brings a whole lot of benefit, don't you think? Well, by definition, the way you put it, yes. <laughs> okay, let's 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 switch over to Annie. Let's see what Annie has to say. Go ahead. No, I mean, I, okay. go, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. No, go, go ahead, Michael. Good. Sure. Go ahead. Sorry, because my previous answer wasn't. Uh, I'm, I'm missing with you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's it's it's the, the question you we had in the notes was is there a middle ground and the answer is obviously yes. So like mm -hmm. if you say is there valued standardization? Yes, there's valued standardization. Is there too much standardization? Yes, there's too much standardization. Um, and so then, in my opinion, the question is, how do you find the right level of standardization between chaos and standardization? And then a few thoughts there. First off, um, often it helps to look at existing data of what is bad about the current system and what needs to be standardized, right? So survey similar consumers of some API or producers of some data and see if there's similarities, look at their use cases, look at their roadmaps. There's no point to standardize something that no one else is going to use. Uh, or that they're using, but they're going to move away from to something completely different. Um, <clears throat> then think about discoverability and making things work as expected. Those are always benefits of standardization. If your code is very non-discoverable, API is not discoverable, standardization helps. Uh, if things aren't behaving as expected, then uh, that's also another case for standardization. And always if you end up cutting corners always look back after launching a feature or finishing a product and ask what kind of technical debt you created how it's going to plug into the broader ecosystem and where you can decrease the friction by standardizing things okay all right let's go to Anne. awesome um i i again like there's nothing in principle that i disagree with michael i think it's all about a matter of scale right and that example he brought up is very interesting is there is no perfect architecture i have actually literally done this i was working for a television graphics company that had this c plus um, plus sort of actually c uh, 2d render they, it was a television render in the sense that there was no room for latency if you said 30 fps it was mixed with 30 fps nobody paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for an ad on prime time so you could skip a frame. Yep. Happy yep. butter smooth. <laughs> here I was saying, oh my God, you could use .NET for this. Stop the world garbage collection? Jeez, <laughs> that's crazy. Now, anyway, if I knew everything that I knew today, would I architect it differently? Absolutely, right? And that's mm -hmm. part of the experience. Mm -hmm. But at that point, what was more important was how quickly people were able to create these animation templates. Because at in the current form, you have to have this editor that was super specific. It's really hard to code new elements, new animations, even like sort of doing things like animation curves and all that stuff was really hard. 3D was forget forget doing all of that stuff, right? So, yep. The, the, there are usually like so. So the thing is, if you pick the right person who has seen similar systems. This is my, my advice to people that are building products. Don't 
look at products that have gotten built and then decide how to build a system. Mm, mm -hmm. Pick people that have built similar systems, regardless of the product. There are similarities between the engineering aspects of certain systems, even though they may be from completely different fields. That's right. And I think that's key is you've got to recognize the problems that are at the root of what you're trying to solve mm -hmm. and then get the best possible experienced person. So I would say that if, if they looked more, maybe they would have found someone better than me and that person would have built a way better system. If they've got future me, I would have built a better system. Yep. My motto is every time I look back on my old code, I always think, what the hell was I smoking when I wrote that? And, and, and that's a good thing. That means you're growing, you're evolving. Exactly. Right? And that's that's really the point. But but that also means that every time I look at any code, I always look at how to make it better. Yep. And and it's not just from a macro point of view saying this feature or that feature. I will actually go and just dissect the entire code. This goes back to my rewrite it four times. And I don't mean rewrite it four times like spend the entire, you know, actually release first version and then can it like Microsoft did with the Windows Phone stuff. No, I'm not talking about that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about even if I'm writing a function, right? John Carmack said sometimes the simplest abstraction is a function. So mm -hmm. it is true. Um, even if I'm writing this one function, I will actually spend inordinate amounts of time figuring out what parameters need to come in, whether those need to be interfaces, whether they're references, what copy semantics they have, and things like that. Yeah. Because usually I would have ironed out what that function needs to do in sort of pseudocode, and that's done. That's my iteration one done. Nice. Then it's iteration two, three, four, where I refine how it's called, where it's called from, who dispatches the call, is it, is it, you know, does it need to be thread saved? Does it need to be re-entrant? All of those kinds of things. If I if those considerations are valid, of course, and they're not valid at all times. But I think that's where standardization is important, is once you start seeing patterns in what you're trying to build, it doesn't have to be at the macro level. It doesn't yeah. have to be at the feature level. It could be in a function that a junior engineer writes. And code reviews and unit testing, well, unit testing is a misnomer because most things are integration tests. And you know that's a different topic altogether. I have a different view <laughs> on just, it. But we'll you just go created another podcast, podcast episode. Yeah, I did. I think I did. But, but yeah, overall, I think that's where standardization and sort of perfect architecture happens is you have to internally rebuild the system a few times. If you take the Stack Overflow code that you found and it works and you commit that, you're guilty of cardinal sin. Yeah, yeah. You know, as a developer, you're guilty of cardinal sin. Yes, it means you can go spend that time with your girlfriend or your dog or whatever. Yeah. But what it means is that you're not dedicated to your craft. Yeah. Think about somebody making a katana. If they said, oh, sharp enough, here you go. <laughs> that's right? right like where would that what, what would that mean for katanas as a reputation so that's right dedication to your craft involves doing the best you can at the maximum extent of how much you know tomorrow it may be a lot more today it may be a lot less but you still got to push that envelope little by little by little and that's sort of i think that i see as as the root cause of a lot of issues today i, I love that mindset i love that mindset uh, Michael, um, on the topic of uh, modern software delivery and, and design and architecture, from your years of experience building software in big enterprises, you know, you've been at Microsoft, you've been, you know, you, you are now at Meta, you know, you've seen things through the years, you know, what's the one thing that's always comes to mind, something that you would advise your younger self, you know, about what you've learned so far in our industry? Right? Uh, read clean code. <laughs> okay. By, by Robert C. Martin. All right. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So I, I was actually going to work that into what I was going to say. Kind of yeah. Yeah, please. Go please ahead. Go. Yeah. Please. Yep. Yep. Uh, and that's, I, I know that I'm coming across as a cut all corners guy. And of course, I don't mean to. I'm a huge fan of clean code. I have it in my status at Meta. It's, and it's, I have it's, it in my... it's just a show. It's just a show. You know, someone has to play the villain. Someone has to play the hero. I'm it's having okay. fun. I got the script from <laughs> this Hassan. Is all, this is all play. for YouTube. <laughs> I'm not actually a software engineer. I'm a bodybuilder. Oh, man. I'm kidding. Um, there you go. Humble brag. Go um, no, I'm just kidding. So 
uh, I, I'm a huge fan of clean code. At, at, at uh, Microsoft, when I used to work in Vancouver, I, we had certificates that we got as like funny presents at, at a Christmas party. And mine was like most likely to comment about a missing space on your code review or something like that. So I care deeply about nitpicking. nitpicking. I, I care deeply about like product quality. And maybe you'll argue that spacing is that important, but I think that clean code disagrees uh, at least a little bit there. So um, I I definitely think that standardizing on at least some convention is is, is very important. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping actually to put together some kind of clean code module and put it into Meta's bootcamp uh, nice. experience. Nice. Uh, if anyone at Meta is listening to this, don't steal my idea. Or if you steal it, give me credit. <laughs> <laughs> Michael came up with it first, guys. You heard it here on Hassan's show. You heard it here first. You yeah, know, I was the very first started. person to think of telling people about <laughs> clean code. Uh, <laughs> we have we have a legal record exactly. of you coming up with this. We don't want to repeat the 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 the, the start of Meta. <laughs> we want to make sure that everyone gets what they created. <laughs> so okay. So, I, I think uh, uh, the other thing that I want to say is like some on the more actionable side. In addition to what I said before, which is be kind of the contrarian voice in whatever your org is tilting towards. Um, is you're probably not doing the optimal amount of either cutting corners or standardizations yes. at the same time. So there's yes. different ways that you currently could be uh, shipping faster and different ways that you could be standardizing and improving the code quality at the same time. Mm -hmm. And the trick comes in figuring out what those are. And it's hard. And you got to stop and you got to think about it. A broader thing that I wanted to bring up is that and that's not super related to what we're talking about, but in general, I think programmers don't have enough time to stop and think. Uh, we're always in the middle of a task, building the next thing, chasing the next deadline. We need to have time that we set aside, maybe a couple of hours a week or a couple of hours twice a week to think about the product, think about the direction, think about what frictions you're encountering, what you don't enjoy about what you're doing, uh, how you can connect what you're doing to what others are doing. Um, is there any like missing opportunity? Are we missing some kind of data? Um, so I think that we don't stop and think enough. Yep. And I, yep. I want to make it a, a broad call and tie it into this topic that we're talking about. When you have a chance, stop and think, can you ship to market faster? And at the same time, can you clean your code? Can you re-architect your code? Can you be a better engineering citizen uh, yep. and, and how? And you can always uh, work both of those into a project at the same time. Sometimes if you propose, like, I'm going to do tech debt pay down for the next two months, your manager's going to be like, no, we need to ship. <laughs> but if uh, <laughs> okay. dog doesn't like that. That's my dog, guys. Excuse yeah. me. Your dog is like, I don't, I, I don't agree. Somebody's walking by. That's, yep. my, uh, that's my doorbell system. Yeah. <laughs> all right all but right. if you find ways to incorporate that work into your current work of uh -huh. improving things as you also get to market faster that's the uh, goldilocks zone i suppose or the the tightrope that you got to walk um yeah nice nice okay and, and by the way michael on this topic you know i always say like in every software engineering team there are cowboys and mad scientists and these two keep grabbing in a different direction you know the mad scientists they want to invent the best regular expression to validate emails and the cowboys they be like hey let's just you know let's just hack something up console dot you know dot exe and just give it to the client and get some money and i think the balance between these two uh, you know I, i've been lucky enough to quickly identify mad scientists and cowboys in every team and if you pair these two together you get the best possible outcome because they kind of balance each other out let's take it down yeah <laughs> you know i said, I said that, I, I said that to someone you know and they said they said they said to me well what about the mad cowboys <laughs> and i was like we don't want to <laughs> i don't know what to do with that you know <laughs> so somewhere in the middle there but uh Let's take it to Annie. Annie, you have a lot of years of experience. You've, you've been around. You've worked with a lot of projects. You have a lot of stories. What do you have to say to your younger self? What do you have to say to younger engineers in the industry? What would you say that they can take on and go take action on and change their career, change their job tomorrow? Go ahead. Okay. So I would say, first of all, be passionate about what you do. Find what you want to do. 
if you so the first thing is a job is just a job right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. some people fall in love with their job not their work mm -hmm. and i think that's very important in some mm -hmm. i am not the sort of mentor that will go and say microsoft is awesome or amazon is awesome or whatever mm -hmm. every company sucks at a certain point they have their problems mm -hmm. and at the end of the day it's a business transaction if your mm -hmm. manager thinks you're not doing good enough for the company, whatever that may be, just because somebody, you know, some VP screwed up in, in, in creating a project, your entire team could be cut and you'd be let loose. Yep. No fault of yours, best engineer. So it goes both ways. So that's my very first thing I want to tell younger software nice. engineers. Nice. Do not love your job, love your work. Yep. Yep. And I think that's, that's once, once you know that you're actually passionate about what you're doing, I think everything else becomes sort of better because you're not actually grinding through stuff. You're actually learning new things. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and that's, that's sort of the first thing I would say to, to my younger self is I've unfortunately burnt myself out a lot, trying to love a job. And I probably wouldn't do that with sort of the experience that I have now. Okay. Um, and secondly, I would also say there is a value in doing different things. Mm -hmm. So uh -huh. some people come, you know, with like, say, 12 years of experience uh, working in a single company or working on a similar team. And I would say that's that's great, but I don't count that as 12 entire years of experience. Yeah. I count that as something shorter because at some point there is things that got coming redundant. Did. There's yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. And, yeah. and that's that's very I've seen that a lot is some people work so much with the inadequacies of system and deal with it that when they're asked to build the next system, that becomes the design pattern. Mm -hmm. And that's that's important to disambiguate. So I would say, go do different things. Go work on completely new things when you're younger. That's the only time you can do it. You get to be adventurous so and from, try yeah. different things. Yeah. It could be sister, like sister disciplines, things that you want to try, but go, you know, uh, if you can switch jobs, great. If you can find a company that can switch roles like Microsoft or Amazon, yep. go do that. Yep. I and and that's that's important to actually get a breadth of experience. It gives you certain perspectives that you could not get if you were sort of in that same same field, right? And that's happened to me a lot. I've taken things from medical imaging and like brought it to to game graphics, or I've taken some stuff from AI and you know thought about it from a from a medical volume rendering perspective, from like my previous experience. The, the, that doesn't matter. Past and present is fine, right? So you just, you've got to take all the experience and percolate it all the way in and have a lot of it to percolate. So that's two of the things I would say is love what you do and do a lot. Take the time to do stuff outside of work. Yeah. Yeah. It's like how they say for kids, right? Um, kids learn a ton before they are sent to kindergarten. Yeah. Then it stops. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So uh, your your learning rate goes down. Why? Because yep. you're you're sort of trying to build on certain things, yep. which are you know form formulaic and and stuff like that. Whereas when you actually are exposed to the real world, you tend to build more. So read other people's code. Work on open source stuff. Pick mm -hmm. a project that that excites your passion. Yep. Don't. I, some people, some young engineers pick up a book and say, oh, what books should I read to learn C-sharp? <laughs> no, stop that. Don't. Pick up the idea. Yeah, pick exactly. Pick a project. Pick yeah. something you want to build that would be useful to you and yeah. go learn just enough C-sharp for it. Yeah. And yeah. build it again and yeah. learn a little more to solve those problems and build it again. Yeah. 90, I remember this one time when I was writing my own Quake 3 renderer and everything just sort of clicked. Like mm -hmm. how everything is put together, how I would, you know, create buckets of shaders, how I would sort shader parameters. And to be honest, that was sort of my like defining clarity moment for that sort of architecture. And I took that in, into my TV rendering role where I actually mm -hmm. created Quake 3 like shaders to quickly allow artists to assemble animations without mm -hmm. creating tons of geometry, you know, just moving textures around, blending functions. People were amazed, like, where did you learn to do that? Right. So I, I was working on this engine and I saw Quake 3 stuff and I brought it here. So it, nice. it, breadth of experience is, is super important. And I think that's the main thing. If, if you're passionate about it, you will do it right. Uh, so 
find your passion. If you're not a software engineer at heart, seriously, don't do it. It's not worth it. You gotta get it. You, you, you're gonna get in trouble so fast. If you, software engineers are gonna find out, you know. Uh, well, so I mean, that's that's one aspect of it. But I would also say, in a few years, you're gonna figure out that that's not your place. Yeah. And yeah. all this time you spent, you know, grinding your wheels against something you're not passionate about, could have been spent elsewhere doing something else. Now I know that I'm speaking from a place of privilege where I've had the luck. Mm -hmm. that actually my passion turned into something lucrative but mm -hmm. that's you know that that's kind of the niche you want to find you want to find the passion space that you can turn into something lucrative rather than the other way around okay so so here's i haven't agreed with any of you on this last question but you're gonna have to deal with it because you know i'm the you know i'm the boss you know so what's your social no 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 so you know the question let's go to michael off the top of your head your favorite quote. Just don't look it up. Just think about it. Something that comes to your mind immediately. You know, like I have one. I always say, take a chance on being loved or hated for who you really are. Jim Carrey, you know, said that. Take a chance. You know, don't try to change yourself for anyone or anything. It doesn't have to be tech related. Uh, you know, it can be literally anything. You know, either one of you, when you're ready, raise your hand so you give the other one a little bit of chance to, to think about one. Go ahead, Andy. <laughs> So I would say that there are two quotes that come to mind always. One is sort of John Carmack's, um, sometimes the simplest abstraction is a function, nice. right? That sort of goes to simplicity. <laughs> and nice. the other one is the Rico Mariani pit of, success, pit of success quote where it says, you make it easy for people to succeed, like a pit. Yeah. And if they want to get themselves in trouble, they really have to try make really it hard, hard for them to but fail. You gotta make yeah. good walls. Once yeah. you move the walls, then you have this sort of safe space, you know? Yes. Um, so those I, are I love that. Really top, make top make it hard for people to fail. I love that. I love that a lot. Okay. Michael, what you got? <laughs> uh, my, well, first off, I want to say pit of, pit of failure and pit of success are really cool concepts. They're what's something that my first manager at Microsoft, um, Adam Kelly, he talked about that and it made a really big impression of, on me. And I have like, uh, a notepad of ideas that I think are central to my understanding of good engineering. And I think that that's one of them there. Uh, create a system where the default pathway is to succeed, not to fail. And there's a lot of systems that you can, you can that. fail easily in that are chaotic, as you brought up. Yeah. Uh, you're writing a book called The Standard. Maybe I should write one called The Chaos. <laughs> uh, so here's a quote that, uh, that is kind of a modified quote mm. from from my from my mom and my grandma when I was growing up nice. that I think is one of the central ideas for me uh, as I've um, done pretty much anything. And that's where there's a will, there's a way. The idea being uh, focusing, like just if you think you can't do something, don't you're believe really that. Yeah. You're gonna find You're going to find a way to do it. Um, so yeah, just focusing on how do I get it done rather than I can't do it. Yeah, where there's a will, there's a way. If you just make oh, that I've a sense of part I've of your... Okay. Okay. Dogs are the best people. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, did we did interrupt? Just wanted to pull that out there. <laughs> Bow body's part is perfect. <laughs> I'm sorry. Horse fairy by Gandalf. <laughs> you shall not pass. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, Michael. Go ahead. Good. No, that's cool. I was just when, saying, if you make there's a well, there's a way. Go ahead. Yeah, Go if you ahead. make that a core part of your philosophy, I think you're going to get pretty far. Yeah, I appreciate Thank it. You. you know, the two of you are just, you know, there's such a wealth of experience and knowledge, and you know, it's 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 amazing just to get people to kind of have a dialogue together and converse with each other and kind of learn from each other and and share these thoughts. You know, at its essence, you know, I have no doubt. You know, nobody on this call you know, is really, you know, I think all of us want to put our heart and soul. If you put, if you, if you put 10 years into something, you know, that's probably something you really like to do, you know? So, um, uh, just looking at your experiences and everything you guys have done, uh, it's such a pleasure and honor for me to be in this company. And I really appreciate you accepting the invitation to come on my podcast and, and share your experiences. You know, this is such a perfect dialogue and I hope like engineers everywhere, you know, to kind of, this is, this is how you disagree. This is how you kind of get together with people and talk about your points. If you dig, 
you know, enough, like Michael Scott from the office, if you dig it long enough in a conversation, you may find a friend, you know, and I think, you know, you should always, you know, approach, you know, discussions and technical discussions with this mindset. Can I make the person that's talking, Abraham Lincoln says, you know, don't I turn all my enemies into, uh, uh, don't I defeat all my enemies by turning them into friends? That's basically the idea, right? You know, you don't have any enemies, you know, when you turn them into friends. So let's think about that in a mindset. You know, that changes everything and it changes our hearts into on our minds of how we uh, learn from each other. Um, as usual, you know, it's always a pleasure to bring in pioneers, people that are really, really into the tech industry to share, you know, their experiences. And uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Annie. You know, I appreciate you both for coming in today. And for the people watching us, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, or compliments for any of these two beautiful people, please drop, drop a comment in the comment section. And don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll see you in another video. Take care. Thanks, Hassan.